This is a lecture on Derrida's Ear of the Other, which, uh, as we're going to see, is a deconstruction of the university. Uh, we, we looked at in a previous lecture Derrida's uh, deconstruction of the concept of the animal in Western uh, philosophy. Uh, here we find him turning his attention to the university. Now, uh, Ear of the Other is a, is a relatively short text it's based on a talk that he gave um, as, as a visiting uh, lecturer, um, but uh, the, he, Derrida has written many other texts on the university as well, such as Eyes of the University, which is a compilation of essays that he wrote on the university, uh, as well as uh, Who's Afraid of uh, Philosophy. So this, this is just one uh, small work in, in a larger corpus of writings about the university. So Derrida had very many provocative things to say about the university as an institution. He was very committed to the idea of the university and, and to rethinking, deconstructing the university, which again means to affirm, deconstruction means to affirm. So to deconstruct the university is to uh, affirm the university as well. And, uh, and so unlike you know, Nietzsche, who left the university as a very young man, Derrida was, uh, stayed within the university all of his life, uh, like Kant, for instance, and was uh, committed to the idea of the university. But that doesn't mean simply affirming an institution as it is given to us, but a rethinking, uh, a taking responsibility for the institution, which is what deconstruction, as we've said, is about, is all about, you know, taking responsibility. Now, uh, here you can see an image of, of an ear, and in the ear of the other, the question of the ear becomes very uh, central to his uh, analysis, and you can see the ear is a kind of like a labyrinth. One can become lost in the folds of, of the ear, and for Derrida, also the ear is a kind of a vaginal image as well. We think of the word as a kind of a uh, a, a seed that, that is, uh, you know, expectorated into the ear of the other. The ear then becomes a kind of a receptacle for the reception, you know, of, of this, of spirit, of the word that is uh, spoken. And so and this is another, this is also this question of the ear is also linked to Derrida's deconstruction of gender, because whatever, you know, however you are, you know, gendered in a particular way, whatever, in terms of what you claim as your gender identity, or whatever your, let's say, your biological sex is as well, uh, everybody, uh, for the most part, has, uh, has, has two ears. And so uh, the, the, the turning of attention to the ear is also a way of thinking about gender as well. Now, in the ear of the other, there's a very provocative essay at the end, which is actually an interview um, called Choreographies about, you know, uh, dancing. And, it, and it's the best place that I know to give you a sense of, of Derrida on the question of, of gender, uh, feminism, feminist studies. Um, uh, and so uh, we're not going to go into that aspect of the text today. This lecture will be focused on Derrida's deconstruction of the university. But um, for those of you that are, that are interested in, in the question of Derrida and gender, um, I, I know of no better essay uh, in, in his corpus of writings uh, where, where there's, there's such a provocative thinking of gender. And so I urge you to have a very careful look at his essay, Choreographies, or the interview that was conducted with him, which you'll find at the, at the back of um, The Ear of the Other. It's also uh, fairly easy to find on, on, on the web as well. Um, okay, uh, so um, there's, uh, there's Derrida. You can see here that he was, uh, this was a colloquium. He's responding to a, a colloquium, I mean, this, or this text issues from a colloquium that was held at the University of Montreal in 1979. Uh, and it later came to be published under this title, Ear of the Other, 1985. And so in addition to the talk, the very provocative talk that Derrida gave at this colloquium, uh, there were, in addition to that, uh, questions that were placed, that were posed to him by the participants at that colloquium. And uh, we, we find Derrida here uh, in a candied way, uh, candied way, responding to these questions. And, I, and, and this place is one instance of this where he's responding to questions. But many of these later interviews that, that were conducted, 
these more informal gatherings that uh, where we find him talking and responding to people. I always urge uh, newcomers to Derrida and to deconstruction to have a look at some of these interviews um, because sometimes when he uh, when he's just in a more informal way exchanging uh, his his ideas, he'll say things that are that you you that are uh, you won't find elsewhere. I'm gonna give you just one uh, instance of this when back in. Uh, in the early 90s when I attended his uh, seminar on the rhetoric of cannibalism at UC Irvine, and he would, his style was very much like you know Heidegger's. He would come in and he would read from a prepared lecture, but then after the lecture, he would, um, he would uh, you know, uh, make you know, informal comments and, and, and speak in a more casual way. And uh, sometimes he said things there that, that didn't get written down, but were very, very uh, interesting. I'll give you just one instance of this. I remember one thing that he said that has stayed with me. And I've looked for it in all the writings that have been published. I haven't found it, uh, anything quite like it, but maybe it'll come out when uh, this book, The Rhetoric of Cannibalism, is finally published. I mean, he mentioned, he said, um, you know, uh, the most violent thing you can do to a child is give it a name. And that that was I'm just giving you one instance of this uh, that, that stuck with me over the uh, the years. Uh, and uh, and so, again, in these in these more informal, casual settings, uh, you, I think you'll find that his thought can be far more often, far more accessible than in the prepared uh, literary texts that he also published, the, the, the philosophical corpus of writing. So, so you know, there's a lot of them out there. So I urge you to have, have a look. And it's the same is true with Foucault. Many of the interviews with Foucault um, make, will make Foucault's work more uh, accessible as well. Okay, so in this text, um, we'll find Derrida responding specifically to two texts by Nietzsche. One was entitled On the Future of Our Educational Institutions, published in 1875. I uh, mentioned this previously in a, in, a, in a lecture on Heidegger and spirit and fascism. Um, this is what the, the text by the young Nietzsche. It's been recently retranslated as anti-education. Uh, it's more, but this was its formal uh, title. And uh, and then in Thus Spake Zarathustra, published later in 1885, which is a sort of philosophical novel that Nietzsche wrote. Um, we find him again returning to a reflection on education, but here he's uh, he's he's older now, and his thought has has matured. And so Derrida will compare and contrast. We'll look at passages from both the very young Nietzsche and then the older Nietzsche, who um, is is meditating also on the university. So again, ear of the other is a deconstruction of the university, uh, much like animal. Therefore, I am is a deconstruction of the concept of the animal. And so we're going to see what Derrida uh, has to say about the university as he as he carefully reads these passages, texts from uh, Nietzsche. OK, now I'll just mention here the few key Derridian concepts that are we're going to say anything but immaterial. We need to just take a few minutes and review a few key concepts before we look at the essay, because I think, again, this is a, this essay is uh, it, or this talk that he gave is a little bit more difficult to understand than the animal that therefore I am, which I think is more a more accessible text. Um, this text is a little bit more challenging, uh, but part of the reason why is because there's, he presupposes a knowledge of certain concepts that because he's speaking to professors who are familiar with his writing and and his thought, and so he doesn't, you know, uh, he's not, you know, he's not giving us deconstruction in a nutshell here. He's he's philosophizing in his own way. But if you know, so if you know what some of these concepts are, uh, then it'll make the essay more accessible to you. Um, now we, we'll we'll do, we'll talk about these fairly briefly, and we'll come back to some of them in a future talk on uh, specters of Marx. But I just want to uh, make, make sure we're clear on our concepts. And so uh, these are concepts that you should know if you're trying to understand the thought of Derrida, particularly when we get to specters of Marx. So that would, I would have you focus in on these particular concepts, which we'll uh, discuss. Now, uh, the, per, the idea of perverformative, again, it's another one of these playful coinages of Derrida's. It takes the word perverse and performative and creates a new word, the perverformative, which is to say he's thinking of perverse in the Freudian way as not necessarily not perverse in a moral stigmatizing way of stigmatizing anybody's sexuality that's considered as perverse. Because remember, for Freud, 
all um, all sexuality that's not you know um, uh, you know heterosexual sexuality aimed at reproducing the species is perverse. But again, not in a pejorative way. It simply means um, it's not aimed at uh, at a, at a kind of a uh, d- uh, disseminating. It's not intended to re produce the uh, species. It's, it's a perversion, a swerving from the norm. Um, and so uh, uh, this is, Derrida is affirming this pervert, the, the perverse in the sense of the pervert formative, because he's giving, and this is what he'll call his talk at, at UC Riverside, the Specters of Marx talk, is that he's, um, you know, he's, it's, it's a talk, it's, it's, it's an oral, oral delivered address, a matter of, of wind circulating in the air, mouth to ear, uh, when he's speaking at the Specters of Marx uh, talk at the Wither Marxism conference, but he wants to, so he wants to emphasize it's the orality and the orality, orality of the talk, the herd and the, and the, the herd, uh, spoken and heard nature of, of the word as spirit that's spoken in this actual context or situation that he's in when he delivers the address. Uh, but it's but he doesn't want us to think for an instant that it is a he's promoting a phono logocentric uh, phal, phono phallo logocentric uh, Platonism as, as which he has he deconstructed. So he's not. It's important for Derrida that he is 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 speaking, but it's not. But he's not metaf- He's not promoting the Platonic idea of metaphysics of presence or implying that. Um, that you know that the that he's an embodied metaphysical uh, presence, so it's not performative. And when he says performative, it's not performative in a Platonic logocentric sense, phono logocentric sense. Okay, um, so well, th- let's let's bear that in mind. It's it's and so he here in this context as well, he's speaking to others. We're reading a transcription, but it is but it is a spoken situation that that w- w- from which this text issues okay now the word specter and spirit in deridian thought uh specter is we can th- every time you hear the word specter you can think of just word for the eyes or sign for the eyes it's it's the thing that can be uh, seen uh but not heard it's the it's the sign the trace the empirical external sign that enters our body on the lens of our eyes whereas spirit is the is it can be heard but not seen it has no spectral character um it is the it's the oral oral word it's the mouth to ear word that 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 is characterized by you know wind and so even though we can't uh, see it it's it, it is still uh uh actually there so again and Derrida wants to insist you can see above us anything but immaterial so spirit and specter are not immaterial they are actually matters of traces empirical external traces in the uh, you know in, in the world of, of of the senses, so spirit though is spoken word, it's not the Platonic spoken word positioned over the written word in that um, uh, in that uh, uh, hierarchical sense, but it is a spoken word, and specter is the written word. So it's so specters of Marx, as we'll see when we get to it, is a matter of specter and of a uh, spirit both. Uh, okay, so the signature. Um, which he'll just talk about in this essay. Now you can think of now we, th- we think of the, uh, the the signature bears the same relationship to the social contract that the yes bears to the covenant. Okay, so we said a covenant is an oral contract or an oral agreement, an oral oral spoken contract, and so a covenant is a matter of spirit. Uh, but uh, uh, but the signature is often what is we sign on a contract. So a signature is a spectral. As a matter of specter, the the yes in, in Derridian discourse is a matter of um, you know coming from Joyce's Ulysses and the Nietzschean doctrine of the eternal return is a matter is a matter of spirit. Okay, now covenants are also in the Abrahamic sense are you know signed with uh, you know the, when when the father cuts the foreskin of the penis off of the child, the father is signing. Is effectively signing a contract with the child, or leaving his signature uh, as a trauma on the very body uh, of of the child. So, but it is uh, in doing that act of arbitrary act of violence, the father is taking responsibility for the child, or saying yes uh, to the child. But but the signature, which is a mark or an inscription, is 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 a spectral uh, inscription as opposed to the oral oral spoken yes okay now in both cases these are as you can see in the next line here 
they are construed by Derrida as living dead words. It's not, he's not, embra he's not embracing the platonic Pauline idea that uh, words are dead letters and, um, and, and the spoken word or, or written words are dead letters and the spoken word is a matter of, of, of the living presence of the individual speaker that the, the, the word, whether it's specter or spirit in, De in Derrida, they both have a living dead character, which is to say they're, they're kind of like zombies in effect. They, they're, they're words that circulate autonomously in the empirical external wor world, and they, they, they have something of the dead about them, and they have something of the living about them as well. So he's, he's mo he moves away from the idea, the Pauline idea and the Platonic idea, the Augustinian idea that specter is a matter of a dead letter and spirit is a matter of, of, of the living word. Okay, so like, for instance, literally in the Christian tradition, uh, when, the, when, when the priest on, in mass, you know, reads from the scripture, you, know, you can think of the scripture as a dead letter that's given spirit or, or, or uh, is, is that when, when it is spoken, let's say, in the context of the delivery of a homily or sermon, when the scripture is read, the, we, in, in Christian theology, we, we could talk about in terms of a resurrection of the word, because the word that is killed is brought back to life, is, 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 is resurrected from the status of being dead. Uh, but in the case of, of Derrida, who again is coming at this from a more you know, Jewish uh, background, it's not, he's not a Christian thinker, um, he's a Jewish thinker, um, words are not, uh, th th there's no resurrection of the word that occurs in the same uh, way that we find in the Christian tradition. But, but at the same time, he's going to uh, suggest that specters still have to be given spirit. And so when we get to say specters of Marx, when he, figured, when he speaks of what he calls the Horatio complex, well, Horatio is, is the scholar uh, who is one of the conjurers with Hamlet and Marcellus who conjure uh, a spectral image of the, um, uh, or conjure the, 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 the res publica or the body of, of the uh, dead king. Um, and uh, that, that conjuring is, uh, you know, Horatio will see he's kind of this, you know, as, as a scholar, as an educated man, he's just not able to believe in, in the reality of, of what they have conjured. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, Marcellus is going to say, thou art a scholar, Horatio, speak to it. Well, uh, you know, scholars are, uh, um, you know, are, are Derrida is going to say are, are those that perform what he calls the work of mourning because they're occupied with the dead, as, as in the specter. They, they, they're, they're, they're people who read quite a lot. And so uh, because they're occupied with the dead, with the dead letters, they, they do, they, they perform this act of mourning. And so, uh, Mar Marcellus has to um, overcome his skepticism um, uh, about uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the spectral image that, that appears, um, and, and he's being urged to do so. This is why Hamlet's going to say to him, there's more in heaven on earth is dreamed of in all of your philosophy. Um, okay, uh, we'll, we'll return to that when we get to um, uh, Spectres of Marx. But uh, so we could think also of the of the of, of the specter and spirit as being, you know, as, as since they have this empirical external, uh, you know, character there. This is also we could think of what Derrida calls the gramma and then grammatology or the trace. Suki rest. This would be the smallest, most irreducible uh, empirical you know, residue of, of the, the, the word, whether it's specter or spirit that circulates in the uh, realm of, of, of the senses. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that as well, but these are key deconstructive concepts. When we think of the word trace, an easier way to think of this is just go, you know, think of it in the way that we discussed in our reading of the British empiricist, like a heart, it's a similar kind of idea. It's, it has the same, it's not exactly the same, but it, it will put you on the right track. Uh, Pharmacon is, we've talked about this quite a lot. This is the dangerous supplement. Uh, difference, um, I'll just say very briefly here, we can't go too far into this today, but this is a key Derridian term bringing together the words differ and defer, um, collapsing them together to create a new word like the, what we call the perverformative. Um, a, a quick kind of shortcut to understand this, although you don't want to, you know, you want to take the time to carefully consider it, but, but for now I'll just say, 
you uh, remember Caputo uh, very, I think, rightly calls difference a surword for core. So one way of thinking about difference is thinking it in terms of our basic, you know, concepts of metaphysics. The difference is linked to the idea of the Cora because it's it's a matter of, let's say, the, the blank spaces that appear, you know, between the letters, which is a condition of the intelligibility of the sign is that it has to have the blank spaces uh, in between it. And so um, uh, you can think of differing as being linked to, um, you know, to the, to the spectral idea of, you know, of difference, you know, words, uh, the condition of a word's making sense at all is that they differ or that a sign makes sense is because it differs from other signs in signifying systems. This is a very uh, Saussurian idea that it's not the identity of the sign with what it, you know, represents that, that makes the sign, uh, that gives the sign its meaning. It's how it, how it re relates differential and systems of signification from other signs in uh, that that are uh, signify uh, defer is is more linked to the idea of spirit because deferring you, know, you think of like the uh, if you need the blank space uh between the letters in a spectral sense to to perform the act of reading you need silence to punctuate oral communication and so that silence though uh, points us to the question of temporality in time and how the uh, you know, if we're, if we're waiting for the word of the other to the truthful word of the other to be spoken, there's always a matter of deferring at work that, that, that this is something that is that is uh, like, for instance, as we said previously, with the question of the yes or the vow, the whether or not that vow, the truthful word is spoken when the, the person who makes the promise says yes. We don't know at the moment that it's uh, that it's uttered. It depends on what we call, you know, again, iterability or it's it's it being repeated in in the future. And this question of iterability and Derrida is also going to be linked to the to the Nietzschean doctrine of of the uh, eternal return, the, the yes saying, which has to constantly be reaffirmed. And also think of you know the vow we talked about in terms of that circular structure, like in the in the case of the covenant. Um, when, when was, as we said, when the foreskin is removed from the penis, uh, it's rolled into a ring and the ring is a circle of that, you know, of return. So that's just, circumcision is, is, is a sign of, uh, of the covenant. It's, 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 a, it's, a, uh, it's also a mnemonic device to help us to remember to remember. It's intended to traumatize us so we won't, you know, forget in effect. Uh, that's, that's basically the, um, the idea. Okay. Um, of course, Derrida was not, I mean, he's using these, these ideas. He's, he's referring to ideas from, let's say, the Abrahamic traditions of, of, of circumcision, but it doesn't mean that he was in favor of the actual act of uh, circumcision. But this, but this, is, um, uh, this is implied in these uh, doctrines. If you think of uh, the idea of, uh, in, uh, in a Lacanian sense, what we call the nom de pair, the interpolation of you know the name into a uh, signifying system. It's, li it's linked to the same idea. Okay, we and we've talked in a previous lecture about messianicity, which we said is similar to the Heideggerian zusage. It's to be distinguished from messianism. So these are all terms, key concepts. Think about them. We we can return to them uh, at a future time. Okay, one thing I would also ask you to think about as we're going through this, in uh, Inspectors of Marx, Derrida is going to kind of playfully uh, uh, throw out uh, this idea of what he's going to call the metaphysics of the sponge. He's not embracing a metaphysics, of course. Uh, his thinking is, you know, is, is post-metaphysical. Uh, uh, one could even consider it to be a kind of an occult materialism, but given the autonomous, you know, nature of the way in which specter and spirit circulate, you know, in, in the empirical realm in an autonomous fashion, you know, and it also even in arguably in an inhuman fashion, in, indifferent to human uh, intentionality, which is the language as, as the always already that's out there um, and, and not something deeply inside of me, but in an empirical external world circulating um, uh, in, 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 this, in these often uh, puzzling autonomous fashions. Uh, but uh, metaphys but but remember we, when we started our lectures we said well there's no philosophy that's not a philosophy of embodiment so I think we could I, I would just urge you to think for a bit about what is Derrida's philosophy of embodiment and um, and so if you know if, if we talked about the Heideggerian design we might speak of the Derridian sponge you might even 
think of our little friend uh, SpongeBob, uh, you know, as as being a kind of a figure of uh, of what you know what our what the entity that we are is in in Derrida, because it's, we seem to you know. Uh, the idea of spirit and specter being, you know, uh, matters, you know, of, of the body, of the fluid of the body, uh, it's it's worth uh, pausing on, uh, and it, because also again, remember, I would just as you as we're thinking about this, remember again, each time we think about spirit and specter, Derrida is going to insist that they're anything but immaterial. Uh, they they are. This is a myth for Derrida. and this is uh, again partly why he's going to affiliate you know, himself or or be, you know. Uh, um, affirming the Marxist tradition as in deconstructing it is that he is, um, you know, he, he's, he thinks of deconstruction as a form of materialism. Okay. Um, so, so just give that a thought. Uh, but now, now uh, let's just clarify. We're going to uh, define our terms here. Here's from American Heritage Dictionary. What is a specter? It's a ghostly apparition, a phantom, a haunting or disturbing image or prospect, the terrible specter of nuclear war. And it comes from Latin, you know, spectrum, and then enters, you know, the French spectra, and uh, then it comes into the English language as well. Okay. Um, here's some Der Derrida defining the term specter. The specter, he says, is a paradoxical incorporation, the becoming body, a certain uh, phenomenal and carnal form of spirit. Okay. So, uh, it's it, it is a form of spirit, so we might note that we can, there, there will be another place. We'll say Derrida, Derrida is going to say, you know, liquid is what you know, uh, you know unites the um, you know liquid is what both spirit and specter have in common. If we put it in terms of let's say Plato's uh, four elements, we could think of you know water uh, that, that they both partake of this common element. Uh, so of course, specter is also, you know, ink would be a matter of earth and water mixed together. Spirit would be, uh, you know, wind, uh, breath, but, but breath interlaced with the fluids of the body. And so the, uh, so, so specter is a matter of spirit, but it becomes phenomenal and, and, and it, it, it assumes a carnal form. Again, this is an idea we talked about previously about specters linger uh, longer than than spirit because when they take on this new carnal form or they become incorporated when they assume a kind of a bodily shape okay uh, the specter is not only the carnal apparition of the spirit its phenomenal body its fallen and guilty body it is also the impatient and nostalgic waiting for a redemption namely once again for a spirit okay because uh let's say again in the case of these these spectral images it's written by derrida that you're staring at at your screen right now the the words that he actually inscribed well i'm speaking and so you could say in derridian terms i'm giving spirit to specter um and and i'm i'm performing the again the work of mourning uh like the uh you know when 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 uh hamlet tells uh or no, I think it's actually Marcella says to, uh, you know, Horatio, thou art a scholar, uh, Horatio, speak to this, this specter. And that's exactly what I'm doing at this moment. I'm also performing the work of mourning because I'm being occupied with these dead uh, letters that Derrida has left behind. But again, they're not just dead letters because they have this autonomous, uh, you know, uh, quality or faculty uh, that again circulates in the uh, to put it in in somewhat problematic terms the ontological world uh, because Derrida is going to you know even reject the idea of the ontological instead he's going to speak of the ontological you think of uh, ontology in French sounds very much like ontology it's you know it's so it's he's again it's a playful way of thinking about you know ontology is 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 about you know the philosophy dealing with question being. The, the logos of ontos or the logos of being um, ontology would be hauntology would be a matter of, of, of hauntings. Okay. So these words are haunted. The, the specters and spirits are, are haunted. They, 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 uh, they have a faculty that within them, that is again, not a matter of me intending the word to mean this or that, but that, that has meaning of its own. Um, okay, so the ghost would then be the would be the deferred spirit, the promise or calculation of an expiation. Okay, and then in ghost, this is in ghostly demarcations, and I'll, I will just draw your attention to this really quickly. Uh, 
there's a, this volume called Ghostly Demarcations, which was um, published after the Specters of Marx talk and after the Wither Marxism Conference is a compilation of essays by prominent Marxist scholars who respond to Derrida's, you know, new, these concepts that he's introducing at this talk, which include, you know, hauntology. And, and they, uh, they, they express some, uh, with some exceptions like Warren Montag and Jameson, among others, they, the, some of them are very critical, like, like the essay by Terry Eagleton was, I think it was probably one of the most unfortunate things that he ever wrote. He was very scornful and disrespectful. I think he, I'm sure he later, he must have regretted uh, what he wrote. Uh, but many, many of the Marxist critics who responded to Derrida were very hostile uh, to, to, to what he was uh, saying. OK, so in his and, and, and many of them applied that, you know, this is not a what Derrida is calling specter and spirit, it, that, that he is promoting a kind of an essentialist uh, uh, transcendental idealism all of his own. And, and here's Derrida's response. He said, if, if by specter I had meant I had simply meant appearance without reality and materiality, I would have wasted a great deal of my own and other people's time for nothing. The specter, which is not, which is simply not spirit, is anything but nothing, anything but corporeal, and anything but mere appearance. So it's not again. Think of the the, the platonic distinction between being and, and 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 becoming, which is a, becoming is a matter of of appearing or what seems to be, as opposed to what is. So he's not. He's saying, look, what I'm calling specter is not just a matter of something that that, that appears. And it seems to be as opposed to what really is true. Uh, it's not just a, a matter of appearance. So he's, he's wanting to deconstructive thinking as he thinks about it. He wants it to be, uh, you know, not uh, metaphysical in the way, say, that Heidegger's discourse is is metaphysical, certainly not in the way that Plato's discourse is, is uh, metaphysical. OK, so here's this smart what called what he'll call inspectors of Marx, the Marcellus complex. This is Marcellus is the, uh, the scholar occupied with the dead or performing the work of mourning. He's obsessed with dead, with the dead, which is to say with specters. Um, and, and, and really, this is the last, the last line of, uh, of, of specters of Marx. Thou art a scholar, Horatio, speak to it. That's the last line of specters of Marx. And again, we might think about if we deconstruct this mode of uh, instruction is, is, again, you can think of what's happening right now is I'm, 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 I'm assuming the place of Marcellus in, uh, in, in being occupied with, with the dead, with the dead letters of, of Derrida and giving spirit to Spectre in these lectures. But of course, I'm not present. Uh, and in and, and this sense, it doesn't you know, even really you know, matter if I'm metaphysically present or not. You know, when you're hearing this, I'm, I'm somewhere else. Um, okay, here's Warren Montag's definition of spirit in Derrida. He says the spirit, and Derrida, you know, he, he, he appreciated what Montag had to say here. He says the spirit is seen only to the extent that it inhabits a visible, sensible body. It is heard only to the extent that its words are embodied in the materiality of voice. The spirit produces effects only by taking on material form. The possibility of spirit derives from the existence of what Derrida has called the trace or that which does not let itself be summed up in the simplicity of a present. This is from of grammatology that Montag is quoting. The trace does not derive from a presence or from an originary non-trace. If all, if, if, if all begins with the trace, this is again Derrida's language here, there is above all no originary trace. OK, so that's that's again not there's no a first mover, let's say, in a, in a platonic sense. It is the repository of a meaning which was never present, whose signified meaning is always reconstituted by deferral. At the origin, then, is trace a materialization uh, behind which or before which there is nothing. The phrase always already points to an ideal origin that is never present except belatedly, retroactively, and paradoxically constituted by its uh, material expression. Okay, so uh, even in, you know, ha Susan Handelman in her book, The Slayers of Moses, makes this, I think, important uh, observation, which she says, you know, like in, in, in Jewish theology, and again, remember Derrida is, is coming from a Jewish uh, tradition, uh, 
uh, there's no, uh, uh, the, the idea, you know, like if we take it to work in of a Jewish, more Jewish view of say the book of Genesis, when God speaks, and this is, this is in the pre Judaic Egyptian, uh, uh, ancient Egypto African traditions, as well as that the world, the world comes into being with an act of, of, of the speech of, of the divine. Now Derrida is not taking a theological position in this sense, but, but in that kind of view, um, there would be nothing that wouldn't always already be, uh, you know, saturated with with this, with spirit or with breath. There would be no nothing prior uh, to the, you know, to to spirit. And so this is also there. We're going to hear Derrida speak of what he calls the inhumanity of, uh, you know, of, of language that it has. It's it's it, it has a kind of a uh, something that that even is 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 prehuman or even arguably inhuman. And so this is also linked to the post-human nature of deconstructive discourse and why some theorists that are interested in, let's say, the deconstruction of the subject and thinking of post, uh, you know, human articulations of theory are interested in post-humanism are also interested in the thought of uh, Derrida. Okay, um, so uh, now we mentioned this previously when we talked about, you know, the, the volcano notion of Yahweh being a volcanic god, or uh, this idea of Ruha, Ruha, Ra, Ruha is spirit in, in Hebraic. It means spirit, but it also means, uh, it can mean evil spirit. So it can be both good spirit and bad spirit uh, at the same uh, time. It has, it can, it can potentially be, uh, be both. Um, and so uh, uh, it's not, you know, it's the, we can th if we think of the ambivalence in the, in the word or the, the, the bifid divided nature of the, of the Judaic concept of spirit as ruha, you know, uh, which, which like the pharmacon can, can have, you know, can be a good thing or a bad thing. It just depends. Or it can also, you know, erupt in a volcanic sense that this is also akin to the idea of spirit in, in, in Derrida's thought as well. Uh, and this is, we think of fire, spirit as fire, it's combustible, it's also a fluid of the body, it's a matter of aspirated breath, a matter of breathing. Uh, we can think of it again as autonomous, inhuman, haunted, you know, living dead words circulating in the empirical external world without being underwritten by any transcendental ground, and that issues from the abyssal coil of the throat of the sponge. Okay, so that's sort of one way of thinking about, you know, spirit, which again is 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 invisible. It is heard, but it's not seen, as opposed to specter, which is uh, seen but not heard, and which is which is a form of spirit, but is different from spirit because it takes on a. a uh, let's say it it becomes, you know, to put it in Marxian terms, we could say there's a kind of a reification of spirit. That uh, that takes place, which also uh, allows specter to, as a reified spirit, to to linger in the uh, ontological, uh, or well, in in the ontological world. Okay, all right. So let's now uh, again. We're getting closer now. Where we can turn our attention to ear of the other. Before we do, though, I want to draw your attention to a very important passage in uh, ear of the other, which occurs in one of the exchanges that takes place. And I think what, which is one of the most revealing places, along with say that little essay at the conclusion of uh, the animal that therefore I am, when Derrida deconstructs Heidegger's views of animals in a very informal, rapid way. Uh, here, he 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 discusses differences between his view and Heidegger's that I find, you know, th these are some of the most important passages in trying to understand differences between the two. Uh, thinkers. And so I want to draw your attention to these passages as key passages in understanding, you know, why Derrida is not simply a French Heidegger or a rehashing of Heidegger, why and how he's doing something different than Heidegger. Okay. And so here's this passage about the, what we called it. I alluded this to this earlier as the intact kernel. Let's, let's hear what he has to say. The question is whether there is a kernel intact somewhere or the other. Uh, and we can think of this in, 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 Cartesian terms is the pineal gland or, uh, uh, you know, the logos, you know, for instance, is there, is there some irreducible intact kernel that we have, uh, you know, what's called, you know, ipsity or oneness that, that makes us the, 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 the one that we are, the person that we are, that would be prior to discourse, prior to language. 
Uh, what Heidegger assumes that behind the Greek language itself, the language which the Romans are supposed to have forgotten, disfigured and, mistra and mistranslated, there was another language, an unthought for the Greeks uh, themselves of their own language. You know, he presupposes something like an arch originary intactness that has been basically forgotten in advance, immediately covered over with oblivion from the first, for example, by the Greeks. This explains, in effect, Heidegger's remark that we should avoid interpreting his text according to a well-known motif of German thought as a nostalgic return to Greece. Nevertheless, it is not a, if it is not a question of returning in the direction of the Greek language, uh, it is at least necessary to presuppose something absolutely forgotten and always dissimulated in advance of the Greek language an arch mother tongue, a grandmother tongue, a granny of the Greek language who would be absolutely virginal, an untouchable virginal granny. The kernel of the original text is untouchable by the translation, and this untouchable something is the sacred, which says, don't touch me. Thus, for Heidegger, there would also be something untouchable. Okay, so the the uh this this untouchable what he's calling here the untouchable virginal granny would be uh this was was what's going to one of the things that we could think of distinguishing derrida from heidegger because he's going to take a very different view of this he's going to say the the desire for the intact kernel let's say in heidegger is desire itself which is to say that it is irreducible there is a prehistoric pre-originary relation to the intact kernel and it's only beginning with this relation that any desire whatsoever can constitute itself. Thus, the desire or the phantasm of the intact kernel is irreducible, despite the fact that there is no intact kernel. Okay, Again, despite the fact that there is no intact kernel. This is Derrida, which would be pre-linguistic. Uh, I would oppose desire to necessity or to anonki. Anonki is the Greek word for necessity. The anonki is that there is no intact kernel and there never has been one. That's what one wants to forget and to forget that one has uh, forgotten it. Okay, one can only forget that there has never been an intact kernel. This phantasm, this desire for the intact kernel sets in motion every kind of desire, every kind of tongue, appeal, address. This is the necessity, and it's a hard one, a terrible necessity. But without the necessity and without what comes along to interrupt and thwart that desire, desire itself would not unfold. Okay, so this is in 115, 116, ear of the other. Um, and these are these are really key passages, and so we can think of that image of the intact kernel. Um, we talked earlier about in Heidegger about you know the, the 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 radius of the circle that every circle, every question you know questioning circle implies a center. Um, this is what this idea of the intact kernel or center is is what Derrida is sort of setting his sights on here and saying, look, there it's it's not there. There's we we cannot not want it to be there, but it doesn't mean that it's there. Uh, and and that's, that makes him different from Heidegger. Uh, and this is also the basis of his claim that Heidegger remains, you know, Cartesian and, is and he, that he's doing something other than uh, Heidegger. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the, 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 uh, in, in response, you know, remember again that um, Heidegger has a critique of, um, of Nietzsche as being Cartesian. And, 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 re and so we could think of here in this sort of, difference between Heidegger and Nietzsche as Derrida as being more Nietzschean than Heidegger. Okay, because remember again in, in Nietzsche volume three, you know, Heidegger is going to say that Nietzsche is Cartesian because he says, well, what is what for Nietzsche is necessary is that something must be held to be true, not that something is true. And so it's this this nihilistic indifference to the is in this uh, in, in this uh, formulation that Heidegger is going to this is going to be the reason why Heidegger criticizes Derrida. Now, uh, here's another quote from Heidegger. What is true for Nietzsche is what is held in being. Nietzsche is basically saying nothing other than this. Truth is correctness. He seems to have completely forgotten his saying that truth is an illusion. Nietzsche even seems to be in agreement with Kant here. Okay, and so I think, you know, if you were to, we don't know what Heidegger would have said to this Derridian critique of him, but it might have been something along these lines. 
Uh, and this is so this is a difference uh, between these these two thinkers. And this is also why I'm going to say Derrida finally, I think, is more uh, is influenced by both. But he finally is, is more a Nietzsche would be my reading. OK, we're going to uh, turn our attention now uh, at last to ear of the other and the deconstruction of the university that goes on in this text. Um, the translator of this text is Avital Ronell, who I said previously has written many very interesting works. You can see some of them there. Uh, Crack Wars, Stupidity, Loser Sons. These are all texts 